This episode of the After Action Review Podcast is brought to you by the Java Can, an all-in-one ruggedized coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so that you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere from your backyard to a mountaintop in Afghanistan. The Java Can will brew you and your team a fresh cup of coffee no matter where life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, get your 10% off. Live life charged. Interaction Review with Rod Rodriguez. And welcome to the After Action Review. I'm your host, Rod Rodriguez. It's been a crazy couple of weeks for me here. I recently launched Clear Combo, a podcast production company, and competed in uh, Capital Post Startup Stand Up, which is like Shark Tank with some musical guests and not nearly as obnoxious judges. So that was cool. That was pretty awesome. Didn't win, but I still had a great time, and you'll be hearing more, of course, uh, from Clear Camo, plugging my own business. Don't worry, though. The After Action Review isn't going anywhere. This is my baby. This is what started it all, and we're going to keep on going. But just be on the lookout for some Clear Camo content. So let's talk about the episode right here. What is this episode about? Well, I hate dealing with weight issues, folks. I'm, you know, I've had them for pretty much my whole life. I've never been one of those eat whatever you want, stealing kind of people. I, you, you know the type. I'm that guy who looks at donuts and gains a pound. So my entire army career, I've been obsessed with my PT score. I never, I've never, i never failed a PT test. And I've gotten taped only twice at the very beginning of my career. So when I left the army, my plan was to stay in shape. But on my own terms, no more getting up at 4.45 to get ready for a freezing five-mile run or any of that. I would go to the gym but still put the work in. Let me tell you how much that didn't actually happen. I did go to the gym, but I didn't have the drive that I had before to put in the work. You know, I didn't have a goal. Like before, it was getting a 300 PT score or making sure that I could hang in those long runs with my squad. Now it was on my own, and it just felt so different that I didn't do what I needed to do. I also got super depressed after leaving, and I ate crappy food that I shouldn't have been eating in quantities. 170 to 230, boom, just like that, snap of a finger, 170 to 230. Eesh. You know, I dropped back down thanks to discovering uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, shout out to Twin Wolves MMA, Harker Heights, Texas, because uh, if it weren't for Hector Ruiz uh, challenging me to take on Jiu-Jitsu, I don't think I ever would have taken that first step to lose all that weight. But it's still been an issue. You know, my last two deployments as a contractor, I've been tough on my weight, uh, trying to get it back in control. In fact, I'm, I'm doing it again. So far, so good. This is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to the folks at Team RWB. They've made it their mission to help veterans create quality relationships and to enrich their lives by helping them find a place where they can be active together. They're more than just some workout club. They're building community. But aside from their mission, running a nonprofit is not easy. Folks, I get emails and messages all the time from veterans who are starting up nonprofits or want to start a nonprofit. And I'm telling you right now, before you make that leap, listen to this interview with the executive director of Team RWB, JJ Pinter. Look, you're going to get a very good idea about some of the major challenges he's faced at the helm of RWB. This is a fascinating look inside the organization. And I'm going to tell you, I walked away from this interview with a lot to think about as I launched my own company. Folks, this is the golden age of podcast. So why doesn't your business have one? I get it. What mics should you buy? How do you edit audio? How do you even get your show published? You're trying to figure it all out while trying to maintain your business while trying to grow your business. Let Clear Camo help you create the podcast your business deserves from helping you choose the right equipment to using ours. Clear Camo is here to help you create a clear message with Clear Camo. Just go to www.clearcamo.com to find out how easy it is for your company to join the podcast revolution. www.clearcamo.com. 
Folks, my guest is the executive director of RWB and former Army officer, ladies and gentlemen, J.J. Pinter. Hi, my name is J.J. Pinter. I'm the executive director of Team Red, White, and Blue. I'm a former Army officer. I was a field artillery officer back in the early 2000s and deployed to Iraq and then left the active service in 2006. I spent a couple of years in the Texas Army National Guard after that while I was working in the private sector. And while I was spending some time working in the private sector, I was really, I found that I really missed that kind of sense of purpose that I had when I was in the Army. Serendipitously, at the same time, some friends of mine had started Team Red, White, and Blue in the late 2000s. And I had the opportunity to leave my full-time employment and come be the second employee at Team RWB, which I did in the end of 2012. And I've been there full-time ever since. Uh, I, take, I took over as executive director about a year ago after our longtime executive director moved on to, um, to other great things. So so that that's me in a nutshell. That's amazing. So uh, I was also an artillery guy. I started my career off in the Army. My first four years were uh, as an MLRS guy. I was a field, uh, fire direction dude. So I spent a lot of my time in the talk, in the Bach, out there in the field, uh, pointing in directions and uh, letting MLRS fire. So I should say I had the opposite experience. I was a, I was a field artillery technically on Paladin, so 155 self-propelled. But I never really, I find that field artillery people, I say, I have to say people now because it's not just field artillery men anymore. That's true. Um, That's true. I... I find that field artillery folks love to talk about shooting artillery, but I never really <laughs> shot any artillery because if I graduated from West Point in 2001, went to the, to, to the officer basic course and then showed up at Fort Hood in 2002. And then basically we were just getting ready to go out the door to, to Iraq and people weren't, my, our battalion kind of like just like retask organized as like this kind of quasi infantry battalion and did like convoy security and so yeah. I, I don't really feel like I, I feel a little guilty saying that I was field artillery officer. Well, no, don't, because, you know, that was 2003, man. That was exactly what we were all doing. We, in fact, uh, you know, I was MLRS. We went out to Iraq. We did our, our we fired for like the first two or three months. Uh, it was all hoorah, hoorah, red leg. And then we became glorified convoy security. We yeah. became the guys that were picking up ammo. I was part of Task Force Bullet. I don't know if you remember hearing about that, but basically... They tasked uh, a bunch of artillery guys like, hey, you artillery guys, uh, you know about ammo. We're like, well, yeah, sort of. OK, OK. You got trucks, right? Well, yeah, we got we got trucks. There you go. So all this loose ordinance all over the country. You're going to pick that up by hand and you're going to put that on trucks for the rest of the year. So we, <laughs> we did that for like nine, like uh, six, seven months of picking up loose ordnance off the ground. And and I specifically remember uh, using a stick to move dirty diapers and a trash dump off of 155 rounds to pick them up. And so I remember we had standard, we did like convoy security and like the low level kind of VIP-ish security, but there was just the standards mission set that we would do, we would escort people. And there was this one particular run that everybody hated and we had to do it once a week. Someone in the battalion would get it and we called it the prison run. And so we would go to the embassy, we would pick up some, some VIPs, some, some people, some three letter agency folks and have to drive them to all of the prisons in the area. And this is in 2003 and it was, everyone hated it because it was just a long day. Oh. But one of the places that you had to go was Abu Ghraib. Oh, good times. This is, this is pre scandal. And, uh, yeah, it, it, we just hated it cause it was a really long day, a lot of driving, you know, in, in some sketchy parts of town, but anyways, just d different times. So, no so yeah, so I guess to, to put a bow on it, like very proud of the work that we did just wasn't artillery. Now I swore up and down once I reclassed, I'm like, never again. I will never do this again. But it's so interesting that uh, you went right to the Texas National Guard. I actually just came back from the Texas National Guard. I was in 36 ID down there in Camp Maybury before I transferred <laughs> up here to Pennsylvania. Yeah, so mine was an interesting transition because if you think back to that point in time, this is 2006. And I, so my contract and my fellow kind of academy classmates contract, we had five years active and then we had three years in active ready reserve, which historically meant nothing. But in 2006, the war wasn't going very well. They were pulling people. My classmates were getting jerked out of the IRR left and right, like pulled out of like law school and med school and all of these things that they were doing 
to deploy. The state of Texas in their, actually, I was going to say infinite wisdom, but it actually was very infinite wisdom. They were really short on like quali- like combat arms officers with experience. And they, they kicked up this program called the Redux program. And it was basically if you, they would give you two days off your IRR commitment for every day that you were in the guard, Texas guard, and they would no mobilization and no deployment outside of the state for two years. And they, they were so short people. I remember the officer recruiter sent me a list and was like, Hey, here's all of the empty billets. Like just, we don't even care what you just pick one. <laughs> you can go <laughs> wherever help you us. Want. We don't even care if it's your branch. Um, and so, yeah, I did. I spent two years. I picked, I was going to be the S4 of a field artillery battalion. That was, I lived in this little town called New Braunfels and I know it. You know it. Yeah. So my wife was a school teacher there and we lived in this town called New Braunfels and I was going to be the S4 and I thought, well, this won't be too, I already know how to do this. Shouldn't be too bad. And I showed up and the first day, I'll never forget the battalion commander walked up to me and he said, Captain Pitter, welcome. I know you're supposed to be the S4. You're now the headquarters company commander. Sorry about that. Needs of the army. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Cool. (laughs) Great. It, it was, and, and I say this in jest, but it was a, it was a really good experience. That is that, but that's still kind of crazy. I mean, as as cool of an experience that is, uh, that's definitely a cold shower to walk into. I mean, you're going into the S four, and suddenly it's like, by the way, these troops are yours, and this is your thing. Good luck with that. Okay, it, that's exactly what it was. But what was really interesting is. I had never gone to what, what was called the captain's career course at the time. And I, I knew that I wasn't going to stay in the army forever. So I never, I never went. And what essentially happened was I stayed in command for like two years there. And the battalion commander was like, Hey, you know, you're doing a great job and I love having you here, but I can't hide you any longer. Like you've got to go to the career course. So you got to get out of the army. Like one of the two. I was like, well, guess I'm going to get out of the army then. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so, um, Tell me a little bit about RWB. I know there's maybe five people on the planet, at least from the veteran side, who don't know what RWB is, but there's a couple of people that might not. Tell me about RWB. What does that stand for and what do you guys do? So team at its very like most elemental level, it stands for team red, white, and blue. And we are a 501c3, you know, nonprofit whose mission is our charter with the IRS is veteran support. So at a very high level, that's what we are. What that looks more like in reality is that we're a chapter-based organization, and we have chapters in about 200 cities. We have close to 150,000 members, and our organization is focused on using kind of physical and social activity to help build relationships and connect veterans to their community. And it sounds very simple because it is, but it works. So we try to be a place in the community that veterans can go. They can get paired up with other veterans, supportive members of the community, and they can do some stuff like get a little bit of physical exercise and meet some other people, social exercise, community service, and get a chance to, to be around and do some stuff that we know is you know, kind of intrinsically good for us. I mean, that's what it is at a very high level. And what does it mean for the people at the chapter level? You know, if I'm a guy and I'm walking in or I'm interested in RWB, what can I expect from that experience? Yeah, so what you can do is, you know, anyone can go to our website, teamrdb.org, and you can see the events that are going on around you. And so what you can expect is those events are all run by volunteers. We have about 2,000 volunteers that actually run our our organization really but run our chapters and our events and you can expect a lot of diversity there's there might be everything from you know a run or a ruck might be a crossfit workout it might be a yoga depending on where you're at in the country it might be rock climbing or surfing or skiing you know our chapters we're, we're i always say we're like the most unmilitary run military organization right because it's very loose in terms of let, letting people um, do whatever they want at the local level, but you can just show up. There is, there's no cost. You know, you can show up, you can be around other veterans. It could be everything from a couple people at a Thursday night run at a local park or to something much bigger. You know, a chapter might get together to do a Spartan race or something like that. So it, it varies wildly. But the important part really is the activity that you're doing is, 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 is important because a lot of veterans really let their physical health go when they leave the, the service. 
but the relationships that you build and the connection to your community that you build is, is really some of the more important part of this. That's always been a concern of mine is the physical health of our veterans. We seem to get out and I, I'm guilty of it too. And when I say, you know, I'm talking about veterans in general, but um, I'm definitely trying to exclude myself from this club, even though I'm definitely guilty of it. I got out and I put on easily 67 pounds, 67. The average pounds. veteran gains 40 pounds um, in well, the few years post-military service. Well, I exceeded the standard, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went out there and I gained a lot of weight. Um, I started doing jujitsu and jujitsu helped me bring my weight back under control. Shout out to Hector Ruiz at Twin Wolves Mixed Martial Arts in, uh, um, Harker Heights, Texas, because if it weren't for that guy putting a gi on me and telling me, go out there, sweat till you puke, uh, I don't know what I would have done. Yeah. I mean, so, and there's the, there's the physical health component, like gaining 40 pounds is not, it's not good for you, right? Like no. your blood pressure, cholesterol, like for all of those things. But then there is the other kind of unintended consequences of that as it relates to kind of your self-esteem and, oh, it, you know, it's, it's just not good for a whole host of reasons. Like here, here's what we know, man. Um, there's like, when veterans leave the service, there's three things that happen that that really aren't good for them. One is their physical, that they gain weight, which is bad. We had just talked about that. Two, they miss the sense of service. Um, everybody does. It might not happen originally, but everybody does in some form or fashion. And three, they miss the relationships. It's hard for adults to make friends. And your prop, most veterans go somewhere else. Um, they don't go back to where they're from, a lot of them. And you, you, you miss the close kind of personal best friend type relationships. And so what we hope is that Team RDB can help in all three of those aspects, right? But, but you, you can get those without Team RDB, right? You can, you can get them at your CrossFit gym or you, you, you know, your BJJ gym or like there's other places you can get those, but you got you to gotta do the work to get those yourself. Like no one is going to hand those to you. Well, but if you do those things, you're going to have a more successful transition. Like that's what the data tells us. What's well, interesting that you mentioned that because the whole the social aspect has a lot to do with the psychological aspect. You look at the the numbers of, of uh, suicides, but I always tell people, you know, yeah, that's bad. But you're not looking at the number of attempted suicide. You're not looking at the number of people who are thinking about suicide right now. So if you've got the number of people that did it, you can you can be pretty uh pretty safe in saying that the number that are thinking about it or fail to do it that number is even bigger yeah i mean mental health is and i and i don't claim to be a clinician i'm not an expert on this but i mean i'm, I'm around it in my in my work mental health is tough i mean what we know is that one in four americans this isn't just veterans one in four americans has some type of um, mental illness at some point in their life and what's crazy is that there's a stigma around it right like so like say you're at you're at jujitsu and you break your arm mm -hmm. like you would just go to the hospital and get your arm fixed right and then you would allow for it to heal and you would be fine on the back end but we don't do the same thing with mental health right like someone can have a someone can have a you know a, it's not forever but someone can have a point in their life where they need some some mental health care you could go to a clinician, you could get treatment and can, you can move on down the road, but, but we just don't do that for, for whatever reason. I mean, there's this stigma around it. I think it's getting better, but it's certainly there. Well, I think, the, and I hate to say the tragedies that we've all faced, and I'm sure you've lost somebody. I know I've lost several people. You know, those are the wake up calls for other people, for other soldiers, for other veterans who, see, who, who watch somebody they know take their own life I'm like whoa 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 wait a minute i was literally thinking about that last week you see the impact that happened do you know that you see the impact of what happened to everyone because of that one loss um i'm very grateful that so many people are recognizing it now i think that's making it less stigmatized but kind of bringing that back to the physical fitness realm yeah. um you're absolutely right it has a lot to do with your 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 confidence um, a lot of people look at their military career as being the pinnacle of their physical condition, the physical peak. I, I hear, always hear, well, when I was in, you should have seen me then. Um, I, I've said that myself. In fact, I just came back from a deployment as a contractor, and I put on weight again. And I just recently – I joined a startup school um, here in Cap with Capital Post in D.C., and they took a picture – and I'm sitting down, and I've got my hoodie on, and I and I realize like, oh my god, I got it. Are you? Are, do you work at Capital Post in DC? I don't work there, but I'm with the. I'm in their startup school. Uh, do you I know work, Emily McMahon? I do know Emily McMahon. 
She's my classmate from West Point. No kidding. Really? She's, oh, she's fantastic. By I'm going to see her tomorrow. I'm going to be like, what's up? Shout out to JJ Pinter. But yeah, so I saw this picture of me and I was like, dude, I got a lot. Of, I gained a lot of weight. <laughs> like this last deployment, I, I came back and I put on some chunk. You know, you come back from a deployment, you see all the good food that you missed and you just start indulging. And, and I started putting away, putting off this whole working out thing. And, you know, I had to make a decision. And that decision involved, you know, putting, you know, changing my diet, going back to the way I should be doing things. What really helps is having that that community support. So when you have a place yeah. to go with other veterans, people that understand you. And you have some accountability, right? Accountability is so critical. Um, that's something I've been trying to do with my own soldiers. You know, Facebook posts. You know, hey, guys, let's post your workout. Let's talk about what you're doing. Um, how does RWB differ from i guess like a just like a, a meetup group well so i think we highlighted what we're talking about here at the end of the day we're not providing anything that's you or unique right like we don't have some new magical form of physical exercise it's really about the relationships and so like what we always say is you know, kind of like the, the branding or whatever is what gets you there, but the relationships is what keeps you coming. And so the relationships that people have, like if you move, we always say it's a community of community. So if you knew, move to a new community, whatever it is, you can say, hey, listen, I don't know anyone here, but I know there's a Team RDB chapter. I know it's full of veterans. I know it's got some supportive non-veterans in there. I can go plug myself into that. And there's like a ready-made kind of pool of friends there. Mm -hmm. That's pretty comforting. So you go meet some people and then... And then you get the shared accountability, you get the relationships and it's, you know, you're now exercising with your friends and people that you know. And so when, you know, when you skip the Thursday night run, you get the text saying, Hey, where were dude, you? <laughs> where, where were you? I, I, I was here, you know, or you, you say, Hey, we're going to train for this, you know, event, whatever it is. And we're going to do this together. We're going to hold ourselves accountable. We're going to run the Marine Corps marathon together, you know, wh whatever it is. I think that is the, what's, the really, you know, we call it the secret sauce, but it's not really secret. I mean, let's use CrossFit as an example. The exercises in CrossFit are not new. Like my high school football coach in the, in like the nineties, we were doing the exact same stuff, but they, CrossFit has packaged it up in a way that they've put community, they've wrapped community around it in a way that's really important to people. And so you've got like this brand community that exists there. And it's the same, it's kind of the same thing for us, right? It's the relationships and it's the people that you meet and the fact that you know that they're likely, you know, veterans or military supporters. And so you've got some, some shared stuff in your background with them. I, I feel the same way about jujitsu. I always tell people veterans, you know, if you're a vet, you're just getting out, highly recommend you guys jump into jujitsu. There's so many parallels to the military, but without any of the details, without any of the, you know, the negatives, Form I suppose. Form no formations. No, no formations. Like yeah. So yeah, absolutely. You get a new uniform, you have a rank, you're starting something from scratch and there's people there of the same rank, of the same skill level. They're just excited to be there as you are. You know, that's actually, you bring up a really good point. So if some of your listeners may have seen this before, we have kind of a trademark red Team RWB Nike shirt that we give to all of our new members. And a lot of, it was never really intended to be this way, but people really look at that like the uniform. It's like kind of, I'm like taking off one uniform and putting another uniform on. And there's something powerful about, you know, being around other people and kind of having the same shirt on and doing the same things together. It's that little thing, a little detail. Tell me, how did RWB come to be? What, how, where did this all come from? Yeah, so there's, I'm going to give you two names that are really important to the Genesis story of Team RWB. Um, the first one is Mike Irwin, who is the founder of Team RWB. Mike Irwin is a, um, he's, he's actually still in the military. He's, he's one of the most kind of inspirational people you'll ever meet. He was a year younger than me at West Point. So he was a 2002 guy. We were both at Fort Hood together at the first cab. We actually were in two seven cab together for if anyone listening knows that. So like Gary Owen, um, so after OIF, we all, so he and I, and then this other gentleman, Blaine Smith, we were all at in the first cab together for OIF two. Got back from that, and I left the army at this point in two thousand six. Blaine went the Q course like SF route, and then Mike was a field artillery or intel. He was an intel officer like yourself, and became the intel officer for Third Special Forces Group. 
And that is where Mike and Blaine met each other and got to know each other. A little, you know, fast forward a few years, they get done with a couple of deployments to Afghanistan. Mike gets picked up to teach at West Point and he goes to the University of Michigan to get a grad degree to teach there, hot off a deployment from Afghanistan. And just to make a long story short, like really, that was a tough transition for him. He's like hot out of Afghanistan with, with third special forces group into Ann Arbor, no, no military. I'm from Michigan. So I can say this, there's no military at all uh, around Ann Arbor and just really struggled with the transition and started with looking for some resources in the community. Couldn't find anything. He knew that like physical fitness need, you know, he knew that like exercise and, and community were, were important parts. And he reached out to some other veteran serving organizations and just didn't find anything. And so he kind of said, well, screw it. I'm going to start my own organization. And that's how team r b was, was born. Mm -hmm. And it started initially with his friends and it, it's actually changed a lot. I mean, if we want to talk about business models and stuff, sure. we can talk about that in a second. But the original business model was, was an advocacy type model where we would pair up wounded veterans with advocates. And what we learned very, very early on is that we had all of these people signing up to be advocates, but nobody signing up to be kind of the, the other part of the equation. So we said, hmm, something's, there's something about the business model that's right here because people are signing up for this, but everyone is signing up to be an advocate is no one is signing up to kind of be the person who's being served. Mm -hmm. And so the McKinsey company did a pro bono consulting engagement for us and helped us really like understand our business model. And that was the point that we said, okay, there's something here, this idea of physical activity, social activity, like that's important, but we got the model wrong. The model needs to be a community-based, chapter-based, free membership type organization. Like that's what the model is. So, so we moved the model around, right about at that same time, RWB had gotten to the point where it was too big to be run by volunteers anymore. And, and you know, we, we had raised a little bit of money and Mike hired Blaine, who he had met at third group uh, and to be the first executive director. And this is back in mid 2012. And that is like kind of the Genesis story of, of team RWB. And then um, Blaine and I are longtime friends, full disclosure. And I, I was looking, I was working for quest diagnostics at the time, which is a huge medical company and was looking to do something different. And, you know, a couple quick phone calls and there, there I am. So talk, let's talk about that business model. So you guys went from an advocacy group to being more of a community-based, um, still community-based group. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, what we found is that when you're trying to pair people up, it really feels a lot like case management, which was not our expertise, nor did we want it to be our expertise, really. That can have a clinical feel. It can, and it is, it can have a clinical feel and it's hard, right? Because you got to pair people up, you got to manage it, you got to make sure you got the right people, you're like managing them on the life cycle. It's, it's, it didn't have the organic feel that we wanted. And the other thing is, I think people intuitively know this, but like veterans don't want to feel like victims. And so yeah. when it just people don't, it doesn't resonate with veterans to sign up and say like, hey, I need help, come help me. Everybody wants to be on the helping side. And so it was just, it was just really imbalanced. And that's how we knew that, but people were still coming to us. And so we, we like, we just kind of said, there's something here, like there's something here, but the business model is wrong. And so we, we stripped it down as Blaine likes to say, we stripped it down to the studs in, you know, 2011, 2012 and said, okay, we gotta, we gotta redo this and get the business model right. And so with some, with some professional business consulting help, we were able to do that. One of the hardest thing for one of the hardest things for a business to do is to pivot, to know when to pivot. So sometimes you see the challenge and you're like, well, this is just a challenge. We just gotta, we just gotta persevere. We just gotta push through. But sometimes that's not the right choice. It's really hard, man. I, I always tell people, I think the most important thing that I've learned over the last six years is how to say no, because people come to us with great opportunities all the time that maybe don't line up with our mission or might be tangentially related to our mission. And like in the nonprofit world, you're always resource constrained, always. So saying no to anything that's not like directly lined up with your mission is really important. But then understanding external factors and how they influence your mission. So let, like, let me give a perfect example. Five years ago, there was massive numbers of people deploying and coming back from deployment. So we were really focused on like receiving people coming back from deployment and getting out of the military, you know, like they're downsizing the military. That's not happening now. So within that, 
knowing that our, our, we felt really strongly about our mission, but there's external factors that affect this, right? So five years ago, there was lots of people coming back from deployments. The, arm, the military was downsizing. We had all these people getting out of the military. So we we're really focused on trying to receive them and trying to get them into chapters. That's not happening now. And barring some, I mean, we could get involved in a war, in, I guess, you know, Iran or Syria or North Korea or something right now, and that would change. But the focus is a little bit different now. So just saying, okay, how are, how are we going to pivot? We, at one time, we were really focused on growing chapters around military installations. And not, now we're not so much anymore um, because veterans are, there's pretty clear data about where veterans are moving post-service and it's kind of south and west. So we're really trying to get, get where veterans are. When you're pivoting, when you're trying to decide where you're going to go maybe the, the the original idea just didn't work what do you have to do mentally to prepare yourself for that what's something that you've done mentally to get ready for those major changes there's a couple things i mean i think this this sounds like kind of a cop-out answer but i think i think mindset is really important here and when we talk about failure this sounds like it's coming out of left field but in a young organization, you have to be willing to try new things, right? You always have to be willing to try new things. Some of those things are not going to work, right? You're going to fail at some of those things. But if you if you look at it like this was a failure, um, that's one thing. But if you look at it and say, okay, I learned something here, right? So it's it's not a failure. I think that's a very different mindset. So when you start thinking about change, I think one of the things mindset is really important where you can't get too wedded to what you're doing. You can't get too wedded to your ideas. You just have to be very, very open. Our chairman of the board, his name is Paul Bell. He's a longtime Dell executive. And one of the things he always says to me is like, when you're going through the, the strategic planning process every year, you know, that's the second thing I want to talk about is having a process to make this happen. But like when you're going through the strategic planning process and you're, and you're validating your assumptions and you're looking at the environment and saying, what has changed since last year? If you're going back through the plan and you and you don't think much has changed and you're not going to do much different, then you should start getting nervous because you're doing you're missing something. Tell me about that process because processes are very important for a nonprofit. Uh, there's a lot of accountability. There is a lot you have to uh, take into account before the next fiscal year. Uh, take me through that. Yeah, so it's changed every year for us as we've gotten bigger and we've gotten more professional. The, the annual planning process has changed. But I think the most important thing is that you have a process and that you go through it every year and you hold yourself accountable. And part of that process is, this is gonna be different, people will probably fight me on this, but like part of the process is looking at the long-term plan. So ostensibly here, you're working with your board to say, what is the, what is the goal for the organization? What do we want it to become? Like five years out, what are our strategic goals? And then to, to walk those down into, okay, what are our, what are our three-year goals and then reviewing all of that long-term planning before you start talking about planning for the next year. So that's part of it is reviewing the long-term plan every year. I think a really important part of it is an environmental analysis every year, you know, doing, doing SWOT analysis, looking at competitors, looking at the market, like doing all of that stuff and really understanding what's going on, not only with your peers, with your membership, with your funders. That's an important part of the process is understanding the external stuff. Um, some people call it an environmental scan, doing an environmental scan. I think the third part of the process is to say, okay, how are we doing on our current execution? You know, ostensibly we're in the middle of a year, like we're doing this right now. We've got six, we got two quarters worth of data underneath us. Like, how's the year going? Are we gonna hit our numbers? Does it look like we're gonna hit our numbers? Did we have good goals? You know, how's our fundraising going? All of those types of things. Doing those three steps before you actually start the manual, the, the process of planning for the next year and saying like, okay, what are our strategic objectives? What are the things that we have to do to be successful to hit the three-year goals and to hit the five-year goals and then mapping them back into an operating plan and budget? A lot of times uh, a nonprofit has those milestones. You have those goals. I think every business really does. It's not just restraint to just the uh, nonprofits, but every business has goals. They have milestones you're trying to reach. Uh, sometimes you don't reach them. And when no. you don't reach them, there's a little tingle of panic that can hit you a little bit. Like why, what's going on? Is this, uh, is this a precursor for worse things? Is it all going downhill from here? Uh, what do you do when you don't reach your goal when you don't reach that, that necessary hit? 
Well, I would say first, I think one of the kiss of deaths for nonprofits is to not treat them like a business. I see a, they are 100% a business. Um, you just don't have to pay federal taxes. And so if you don't treat them like a business, I think, it, you know, if you want to be around long term, then you need to treat them like a business, uh, I would say one. The second thing I would say is that if you were just setting easy goals for yourself that were just layups that you could numbers that you could hit every year, that's boring. A, that's boring. But B, like you're not living up to what your organization can be. I would hope you're setting aggressive goals for your organization that you can, and you're hiring aggressive people who can go after them. And I think part of the process is to just be honest with yourself at the end of the year and say, okay, did we miss this goal because we set it too high? Or did we miss this goal because of some other reason? Something is structurally wrong. You know, our program's not working the way that we thought it was going to work. Like we're not fundraising the way that we thought we were going to fundraise, you know, just to be honest with yourself. And then I think that's a really important part of the, of the process is just to be willing to be honest with yourself. And, um, you know, hopefully if you're planning the business, if you're kind of running the business, you don't ever get to panic, right? <laughs> I, I hope we don't ever get to a place where we're panicking, but I hope six, nine, 12 months out, we see trends that we say, time to pivot something so we don't get to panic. I think a lot of new business owners have that issue with, uh, you know, dealing with the emotional side of being an entrepreneur, dealing with the emotional side of being a business owner. They, they do. And so here's one thing that is different about the nonprofit business in the, in the for-profit world, which I came from, success is, is very simple. It's profit. You're either making a profit or you don't. I mean, like you can, people could talk about customer satisfaction and that, 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 like, you're either making a profit or you're not making a profit. Like someone is, consumers are telling you by their purchasing habits. On the nonprofit side, it's much stickier. If you think about what we do, we're trying to enrich the lives of America's veterans. How what do does that mean? Yeah, right? well, how do you measure that? I, I can, I'm happy to talk about how we measure it. But be, before I do that, it's like, that is inherently a qualitative thing. That's a psychometric thing. Right. So we get into this world of talking about outcomes, right? Where how are we moving the needle on, on these things that are, that are more qualitative, that are still really important, that are more qualitative, and it's different for everybody. So, so for us, the, I'll, I'll tell you exactly, this is, we spend most of our time focused on this. There are, there are scales that is, there are validated kind of survey instruments that exist out there that are psychometric in nature, which, which means I don't want to like nerd out on you too much here, but it means you, you can put a number on something that is inherently qualitative in nature. So an ex a great example that I, I, that I like to use that I learned from our research director is let's say we wanted to, to measure love, right? How much do you love someone in a way that is mathematically kind of defensible and repeatable and is understandable by all, like what would make you love this person a 78 out of 100 and this one a 40 five out of 100, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about putting numbers to something that's inherently qualitative, but you can do it. You can absolutely do it. So for us, we have a survey instrument that we developed with Syracuse University called the Enriched Life Scale, which is a combination of physical health, mental health, emotional health, sense of purpose, relationships, and like engaged citizenship. And there's questions. So you're answering questions, which dumps into a number. So what we're trying to do is move, it spits out a number. So, so Rod, you are a, you know, 65 or whatever. Right. We're trying to move that number up over time. That's what we're trying to do. We're and trying to enrich your life more over time. And if people are coming into our organization with really low levels of enrichment that we know that they probably have risk factors, um, you know, and, and may need services outside of, of what we can provide as an organization. And you use those metrics as part of your, your goals for the year, the quarter, or is that something completely different? You just kind of, is that connected to the, the inner workings of your nonprofit? So we're just starting to, this is stuff that takes, we've been working on this for a half a decade, right? So this is long-term stuff. So we're, we're now starting, I think next year, we'll set some, a strategic objective around having enrichment in it, like moving, actually moving those numbers. Um, now we're using what we call engagement numbers. So for us, you know, just to lift the hood up, we have three strategic objectives. There's three things that we have to do to be successful. We have to engage with veterans. 
That's the number one most important thing because we know that the more that we engage from our, from our research, we know that the more we engage with veterans, that that leads to higher levels of enrichment. We got to raise enough money to cover our operating expenses and we have to have a really strong brand. Our brand health has to be good so that veterans want to keep coming to us and that the, the general public has a positive connotation with Team Army. So those, those are the three things that we care about. Take me through a win. What is something that RWB has done recently that you can conclusively say, wow, that was a win. That was a home run. So I will tell you something This I'm super proud of. Two weeks ago, we published a paper in a medical journal about Team RWB and, and our business model. This is, we've been working on this for, for years and years and years, and there's, there's no other VSOs that are publishing papers in, in legitimate academic medical journals. So this is Translational Behavioral Medicine, the, the journal. of, um, And so that has been a huge win for us because not only, it, it's a win for a couple of reasons. A, it, it just demonstrates the efficacy of what we're doing, but B, we're trying to create knowledge and we're really trying to, this isn't a veteran specific medical society. Like we're trying to contribute knowledge and we're trying to change the way that America thinks about supporting veterans. And this is one of the ways that we're doing it through thought leadership. That's pretty impressive. Um, you know, speaking about this paper, uh, what, what, what's in that paper? What does that paper detail? Yeah, so it, it, essentially it is the using social connection as a public health intervention okay. to help combat loneliness and isolation. So, so it's basically a detail of like your model, like what what is yeah. it that RWB does? It's exactly what it is. I mean, so if, if, if you follow this type of thing, lone, the CDC and a lot of other public health kind of research institutions say that loneliness and isolation is the next public health epidemic. This is outside of veterans. This is just people just in, in general, general right? Yeah. Like we're more isolated and lonely than we ever have before. And that's, that's affecting us in a whole bunch of bad ways. So, so people are thinking about how do we combat that, right? How, how do we have people, you know, actually talking to each other and not like playing Fortnite for 10 hours a day? You know what <laughs> I mean? That's true. And, and so this is what, you know, so with the way, one of the ways that we were able to publish this paper was, was using this idea of using like social connection and physical fitness um, to help fight that. So if somebody out there right now, there's, there's a, a veteran who's thinking about a nonprofit, he has an idea, whether it's community, whether it's mental health, but he's, he's determined or she, she might be determined to create a nonprofit for themselves and for others. What is your advice to that person who wants to start their own nonprofit? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. No, I'm, I, what, what I, and I'm not trying, what I'm trying, what I would say is, don't do it unless a bunch of conditions have been met. Okay. There, there are already a bunch of really good nonprofits out there. So if you, you know, we we're talking about being honest with yourself earlier. Right. Yeah. If you go through the process and you see that there is some need in the market that you can quantify that's not being met by someone else, then, you know, what I would say is to take that idea and to go work with another and try to find another organization that you feel comfortable with and try to work with that organization to try to, to try to meet the need because starting a nonprofit, so much of your effort is going to go into the starting of, and the management of the business as compared to like the delivery of the idea that if you can work with someone else who met, who can, who can do all of that stuff, then I would say that that would be the, the, the place that I would start. Um, because there's a lot of really smart people that are working on this stuff and, but, but let's say that you have, there is some unmet need in the market that is there and nobody else is doing it. And, and there's, you know, then you could, you could go down, I, you know, again, I would, you could go down the process and there's a lot of, in the veteran space, especially there's a lot of people who will help uh, veteran entrepreneurs are some of the most like giving of their time that I've ever met. So there's a lot of people that would help you, but I would just say, be really honest about, about your idea, just because what I see a lot is people with huge hearts that say, I was struggling. This is the thing that helped me. And I want to share this with other people. And that's not a business model. And, yeah, that's absolutely and, true. That's, that's a great point is just because you want to do something doesn't mean that your idea is necessarily a good business idea. It could be great for you. It could be great in small, 
movement, but I mean, for big movement, for big business, or even just a nonprofit or uh, a startup business, it may not be ideal. Uh, that's why I would say, take, take that passion, take that idea, go find an organization that you can volunteer with or help with, or, you know, they can help you get this off the road and work with them. Almost, you know, Listen, people talk to me all the time with ideas about this stuff. And on almost all the time, I think that is the best option, you know, because people don't think about a nonprofit is still a business, as we talked about earlier. And people don't think about all the stuff that goes into running the business that are going to, you know, you're going to spend as much time dealing with workers comp and unemployment insurance and like, you know, all of those types of things. Once, once the business starts getting bigger, like yeah. human resources and like, labor laws and all, all of the stuff that you have to deal with. If you can take that passion for serving and find someone else who's, who you don't have to do all that stuff. You can just be focused on, you know, serving. I think that's a really good option. That being said, there may be some great idea that's, there may be some unmet need in the market that we're all not thinking about. And there may be some solution that we're all not thinking. I'm, that certainly could be the case. I would just say, do your due diligence and make sure that those things are valid before you start dumping time and money into starting your own organization. For sure. Now, if we want to learn more about RWB, where do we go? You just go to teamrwb.org and everything you want to know is on there. I would, I would, I would recommend that people join our organization. It's free. You can get a free shirt and it's, it's very simple to do. And I would say, just go find an event around you and come out to it. I mean, there's, I think I just looked, I think we've hosted about 25,000 events so far this year as of, so there's a, you know, a lot of these events, when people talk about events in the nonprofit world, they traditionally think about big kind of fundraising type events. Most of ours are not that most of it is like runs, rocks, walks, yoga, CrossFit. It's like smaller and more intimate. But that's exactly what veterans need. Any parting shots for our listeners? No, I would just say, thanks for having me on the podcast. I think this is awesome. I think this is the kind of stuff that we need to be talking about. And, you know, they can, you know, my contact information is on the website. If anyone has any questions, I didn't mean to discourage anyone, but I just want to be honest when we start talking about, you know, businesses and listen, like in the last six years, we've made every mistake that you could have possibly made along the way. And if I can help someone from not doing those same things, then, you know, I'm happy to. That's what great. That, that was an honest answer. Honestly. Uh, I like that. It was shocking to hear somebody say, don't do it. Uh, but you're, you're, it's not, be, it's not, don't do it because you can't do it. It's don't do it because there's a chance somebody else has already got the mechanics in place. They already have the foundation. They already have the process. What they need is your critical piece to make the mission enriched, not necessarily yeah. reinventing the wheel every time. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to say that because I don't want more nonprofits or anything like, like that's not it at all. What I care about is serving veterans. So however that happens, like whatever the best way for that to happen is, I just, I've seen this over and over again yeah. where, 100%. you know, we're, with the, with the starting of nonprofits. So take that passion, go find an organization that you feel comfortable with and lines up with your values and everything else and work with them. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be on the show. Uh, your insight is much appreciated. Folks, that's RWB. Uh, John, thanks again for being on the show, man. Anytime. To learn more about Team RWB, head over to teamrwb.org. The link is in the show notes. Folks, don't forget to like, listen, subscribe, and share this podcast. Support veteran business by supporting the leading podcast and veteran business. It's this one. You're already listening to it. Go check it out on iTunes. Leave us a, uh, a review. Give us a five-star review if you think that we earned it. Leave a comment. The After Action Review. We are here to make veteran business your business. And of course, don't forget about our sponsors and affiliates. Check out the Java Can, an all-in-one ruggedized coffee brewing system designed by Green Beret so you can brew the freshest cup of coffee anywhere life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com. Use coupon code AAR at checkout. Get 10% off your purchase. That's coupon code AAR at checkout. Get 10% off your purchase. Live life charged. We're also an affiliate of on it. O-N-N-I-T.com. I'm a huge fan of Alpha Brain. It's been clinically proven to enhance memory and focus using nothing but all natural ingredients and no stimulants. I can feel the difference, folks, when I'm using Alpha Brain. Go to O-N-N-I-T.com. Use 
coupon code AAR checkout. Save 10% your purchase. That's onnit.com. Coupon code AAR. Save yourself 10% on your purchase. Your business is worth it. And if your company, your business is interested in starting its very own podcast, check out ClearCamo, your podcast production solution. Go to www.clearcamo.com. Join the podcast revolution, folks. This is the right time to strike. Your business is not just worth it. It deserves it. That does it for me, folks. I'm going to see you at the next episode.